ex choir speaker Ali Ahmed Wright Ahmed Lawan and urges National Assembly to override Bahari. This is Cross Politics. I am Mary Anna Cole. A former member of the House of Representatives, Ali Ahmed, has asked the Senate President Ahmed Lawan to override President Muhammad Buhari's decision on some constitutional amendment bills. He explained that Mr. Buhari specifically rejected some bills that would strengthen the National Assembly as an institution, noting that the legislative arm must stand against the President in the interest of the institution. In March, Mr. Buhari assented to 16 constitutional amendment bills passed by the National Assembly and 24 state houses of assembly. However, he declined to sign 19 others into law. Mr. Lawan had stated that the Senate will investigate the refusal of the president to assent to these 19 bills. Some of the bills the president declined action to have to do with strengthening the National Assembly. Joining us to discuss this is George Ashiru. He's the chairman ADC Lagos State. And Professor Richard Wokocha is a professor of law at the River State University of Port Hacker. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Thanks for having me. Great. All right. I'm going to start with you, Professor uh, Wokocha. Let's look at the, the issue raised by the... Um, lawmaker in Kwara State. Uh, he obviously um, was part of those who, um, you know, looked at some of those bills, the 16 that Mr. President had, um, you know, given his assent to. But now 19 of those bills are yet to be, um, you know, signed. One of those uh, is um, uh, the power to summon the president, the inclusion of former heads of National Assembly in the Council of State, and the reduction of the period within which the president or the governor of a state um, may authorize the withdrawal of monies from the consolidated um, revenue fund in the absence of an appropriations act from six months to three months. But let's start with the very first one, which is the fact that the National Assembly does have the power, would have the power to summon the president. Now, we've seen over time that the National Assembly has summoned several um, government uh, members of the Executive Council, ministers, sometimes um, the governor of Central Bank, we've seen that half the time these people do not honor the summons. Would this not be a way to deepen our democracy in the words of the Quara State lawmaker? Professor Wakacha, can you hear me? Um, whether it succeeds in deepening the... Yes, I can hear you clearly. I can hear you. All right, go ahead. Clearly. Yes. Now, whether it's, it will succeed in deepening democracy or not remains to be seen. Um, the power that amendment was speaking, it's not entirely new. Um, Section 89 of, uh, of the Constitution, where the National Assembly is empowered to uh, someone, any person in Nigeria. Any person in Nigeria means any person in Nigeria. Nobody is excluded uh, who may possess um, information or document that is relevant to an investigation they are conducting uh, over matters with respect to which they have competence to make law. So that power, in a way, already exists. And uh, if persons have not been obeying it, they have the power to compel attendance of those persons. And if they have not been able to enforce that part or to apply that part of the law uh, by asking maybe the Inspector General to produce that person, uh, it's not a question of uh, enlarging the provisions in the law. If you have a provision already made for you to utilize and you're not utilizing it, it's not likely going to get better by the fact that... Uh, Professor Wakacha, I think we're having connection issues with you. Sorry. There um, you're breaking, so we're going to try to see if we can get you back um, into um, the meeting so that we can hear you better. But let me come to Mr. Shiru. Um, it's very interesting that one of the most important uh, on the list of priority of these bills is the power of the National Assembly to summon governors 
and even Mr. President to talk about um, spending or let's look at it generally as accountability of sorts, especially when the lines are blurred. For example, we know that right now, um, I think just barely 24 hours, the um, Attorney General of the Federation and the Finance Minister just finally agreed to um, appear before the National Assembly for a sum of 200 million um, that they've not been able to account for. Now, we've seen this happen so many times. Governors write bogus um, budgets, and half the time, these budgets are not implemented, and the, um, nobody's asking questions. And national assemblies and state assemblies should be asking those questions. But how do we deal with that issue if we have rubber stamp legislatures spread across the country? Thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm going to take, the, take this from a political angle, obviously, as a political leader. I think uh, corporate governance is clearly uh, a, you know, a problem in a political space. Uh, the, the concept of impunity, uh, you know, it doesn't even start from the electoral season when individual uh, candidates don't even want to appear for debates. How do you then hold them to account for their actions, their thoughts, their policies, their programs? And when they get into power, there's this tendency to go back into our cultural um, uh, instincts, which is to protect our power, protect our power base. So what I believe here now is that it's a, it's a case of the executive believing that it does not report to the legislature. And so it cannot be held to account um, by virtue of, you know, the political process, not even because of the constitution. We already know the constitution is, is weak in many areas because of the fact that it was put together by military government in a short period of time. It hasn't considered all of the various issues that are pertinent to our nation as a multicultural nation with diverse issues and diverse problems. And that's why the amendments are important. The amendments are trying to correct over time all of the issues that we have, you know, in, in the absence of a sovereign national conference. Mm. And so I believe that calling those in the executives to account for their actions is corporate governance. It is, it is expected, it is statutory, and them not accepting to go forth. I, I think I think voters should take note of it, you know, and 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 take that into consideration when uh, people are being voted for in the future. However, uh, purely constitutionally, if the if the constitution is not very clear, I'm not a constitutional expert like professor, it's not extremely and very 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 clear as to the supremacy of the legislature over the executive. The president would always feel the legislature cannot uh, call for it to to appear before that. I mean, we can't even have a uh, a state of the nation address as requested by the National Assembly, by the president. The president has the power to veto bills that's been approved by two-thirds of the entire country. So I think there's a weakness itself in the Constitution that needs to be addressed holistically, um, and therefore we will be able to avoid this piecemeal approach to solving our national problems. I, I, I like how you brought in the issue of sovereign national conference. I mean, uh, all, all of these things have been adopted one way or the other at different points in the life of this uh, country, uh, especially in our democratic setting, uh, to see how we can address the constitutional you know, loopholes that we have. Because we have, half the time, when you're talking to people about you know, what, how um, our governance, how flawed our governance is, many times they point to the inadequacies within our constitution. First and foremost, many would say that this constitution was not crafted necessarily for a democratic system of government. Um, many would point to the fact that these, this constitution, um, as amended, um, is, was crafted by military rulers for a democratic mm -hmm. setting, hence making it very difficult to adapt to. Um, but then let's look at some of these sovereign nat national conferences that we've had, even the CONFAB that we had. Um, where, where are those, you know, the, the deliberations, the outcome of the CONFAB? They're packing up dust somewhere. So it's like we spend money to address these issues, but we never get to the nitty-gritty of addressing the issues or even the action of making these issues become some bill or law. Yeah, because the, the, the sum total of what was discussed at these various conferences in the past were not converted to bills that were approvable. So you knew that the intention was to have a talk show <clears throat> to come up with ideals but you then have to go through the painful process of going through either a national referendum, which is not in the Constitution, or taking it as bills at the National Assembly and then the State Assembly and assented to by the President so that we can then have the decisions made in those confabs applicable. But we do not know 
that enough of the issues raised were converted to bills, and that will have made a difference. Of course, of course because of agitation, certain areas like uh, deriv derivations, you know, going to states that are producing whatever materials, we know that some of those ones have been able to scale through. But that's because of armed, uh, you know, agitations. It wasn't because, you know, it, uh, the people in power thought this was the wisest way to devolve power to the people. If you look at the exclusive list, if you look at the concurrent list, it's, it's too top heavy. So the amendments are critical, and the, the, the overriding power of the National Assembly if, is that if a bill has been passed by the National Assembly and state assemblies, it should be able to stand in the, in the Constitution with or without the president. So when the president overrides it by veto power, the, the National Assembly has the power to override the veto. But when you're in the same party, you know, clearly you're not going to go against your president. And so this is where we are. And the 10th National Assembly is going to be modeled up. We're going to have eight parties there. So let's see how it all goes going forward. Mm. Uh, let's see. Um, Professor Wakocha, let me come back to you. Let's talk about the, um, the constitutional aspect of this. Just like uh, Mr. Shiru has said, he's mentioned that, of course, the, the Constitution empowers certain... Um, gives the National Assembly certain powers. For example, Section 58, Subsection 5 of the 1999 Constitution gives the National Assembly power to override the President on a rejected bill. But then we never see... I mean, um, pres the Senate President, Ahmed Lawan, had said they will investigate. And it's a few days to go, and he will no longer be Senate President. And this particular um, Senate and this particular National Assembly would be passed, and then a fresh set of people are going to come in. Why do you think... It's taken so long um, for the members of this National Assembly to override Mr. President. Or could it be that they somewhat agree silently with the position of Mr. President? Well, I think um, uh, it's unfortunate Mr. President did not indicate why he uh, refused to assent to those bills. Uh, but just looking at the bills the way they are, you may find that some of them uh, uh, rather duplicative because um, if you look at section 88 of the constitution as well as section 89 of the constitution um, you'll find that it gives the National Assembly the power uh, to investigate matters and gives them the power to compel attendance uh, however uh, it says any person and any person covers everybody but again you will remember that the persons of the president, the vice president, governor, and deputy governor are by section 308 of the constitution made immune to prosecution. They cannot be compelled to attend any investigation. They cannot be uh, proceeded against in a civil proceeding or any of such uh, things. So if, if you look at it critically, that amendment to be proposing that it should be possible for National Assembly to compare the president to do what Section 308 says cannot be done. Uh, those may be some of the silent constitutional issues that may have warranted the non-signing of uh, those particular ones. Uh, but as for the decision of the um, of the Senate president uh, not to override, where well, he hasn't said they have no intention to override the uh, president on uh, the veto of the president. However, uh, considering that they are of the same party, perhaps it's expected that there will be some consultation before they will proceed to the inevitable, uh, which is deciding whether or not, in the interest of the nation and of the people, they should override uh, the presidential veto. Uh, the power to do so is always there. It's the courage and determination to do so that sometimes uh, determines whether or not uh, we see our legislature put that power to use. Uh, but I do not think uh, it's a matter uh, to rush uh, because a lot of times our laws are made as if uh, privilege uh, was not had to the Constitution, as if they did not have uh, access to the Constitution to see that some of those things are duplicitous and uh, are not necessary because they are already provided for. Mm. Le talking about timing, um, I just would like to take our minds back that the National Assembly and all 36 states uh, assemblies across the Federation had spent three years, expended billions on considering 36, if I'm not mistaken, 68 of these bills. And for them to not, again, spend more time to see which is most important, prioritize it, and see what they could veto on. I mean, because like I said, we're counting down 
to the handover to a next and a new administration. And these bills are yet to be written. For me, it sounds like something that we often do. We make so much noise about, you know, this constitutional amendment, but then we never get to the point where we actually amend that constitution and let the people get, you know, value, in quote, for the monies that, um, you know, we push into these amendments, these bogus amendments. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Perhaps, um, perhaps the timing um, was a bit poor. Uh, timing for forwarding those uh, bills for us sent was a bit poor. Uh, but that stage, I think that one month is enough time for the National Assembly to do what it needs to do, um, where the president has failed to assent to the bills, where he vetoes the bills. Uh, however, I mean, look at it. You have approximately one month and uh, one month and either nine days or ten days uh, left. Uh, with that, the National Assembly feels strongly that those are amendments that are absolutely necessary. Uh, they can go ahead and exercise the power as uh, the gentleman is calling on the Senate president to do. It lies within their power. It's not a question of whether they have sufficient determination uh, to drive those changes for the people and uh, in the interest of the nation. Mm. I think subsequently it would be good to um, adopt a better timing so that you don't do it in the period that you are in a hurry and you won't have time to react should the president mm. uh, veto the bill. Let me come to you, um, Mr. Shiru. Let, let, let's talk about um, precedence because, you know, in this country, um, that's the kind of thing that we always, you know, pay attention to, precedence. Now, um, former Speaker of the Senate, uh, Senator Pius, I am Pius, um, you know, he led the National Assembly to veto President Obusha um Order of um, Presidents Act in 2000. Um, I mean, we all remember that President Obasanjo didn't want to accord due recognition to principal officers in the National Assembly. We remember very well. Um, but the following year, the president also vowed that the NDDC Act would never become law in Nigeria as passed by the National Assembly. He vetoed it again. The senator defied and overrode that veto. Uh, you know, that veto. And so I'm asking, if we've had so much precedence, again, why is it taking long? I mean... Professor Wokocha is saying that, oh, there's some of these bills that already are, th that have provisions in the Constitution. But these people have had three good years. Why is it taking long? I mean, if we know that this is, this is already in the Constitution, we'll toss it out and then tell the people, as the Ninth Assembly, this is what we think we should override Mr. President on, and here you have it. And would this not be a good legacy before these people leave office? <clears throat> so you're, you're very correct. And as a matter of fact, I think the, the, the critical issue is that uh, it's politics. You understand? Um, as much as the interest of the people is important to those in power, it's also important to keep a certain kind of party discipline. So while there is an understanding that uh, certain issues are pertinent to the people, the process and the timing for, uh, for applying them are also critical. Um, I don't think a party wants to uh, reduce the power of its president, the president which it has voted into power. And so whatever they do, even when a bill is brought, it's, it can be a private member bill, and the bill could come from the opposition. The bill could come from, from, uh, from civil society. It could come from citizens. And so the party will do whatever it, uh, it can to take the items of that bill that are, you know, that are useful and, and, and applicable uh, and as safe at the same time for its tenure in power. So I think uh, if you look at Pius Annie, what he did at that time was that a lot of bills are presented to Obasu Jowa, consolidated bills. And so it was difficult if he did not agree on one item to simply jettison everything. So he learned to break down the various um, items in, into separate tiny bills so that you did not have a consolidated rejection of veto. And I think this, the various national assemblies that have come after that have learned that technique as well. Uh, however, um, it's on record that President Buhari has vetoed uh, far more bills or refused to assent to uh, far more bills than his predecessors, which means that really 16 bills is quite a lot of bills that this national assembly, this ninth assembly has worked on. And we should give them the, you know, the, the credit for that. But the question for us is, why is it that all the bills ascended to by the president are bills of things that are not of critical uh, importance to, to, to the nation as a whole. Uh, they do not uh, influence, like for example, 
the devolution of powers to the states, uh, financial independence. Those are the critical things people want. They want some kind of uh, the capacity to believe that we are a federation. Mm. And therefore, the state governors are just as powerful and, and so on and so forth. So those are the bills that currently now have those issues, as well, of course, the power of summons. Because then if you're not... Uh, okay, let us even leave the immunity of the president. How about the central bank government? Mm. How about ministers? Are they all immune? They're not immune. But they, are, they believe they are covered by presidential privilege. That if the president says, don't go, that the president's immunity covers me. So those areas are very important to be attended to on their own merits. And, and, and uh, you know, after May 29, any bill that is not ascended to, and uh, there's no overriding of that veto, it will have to be taken from scratch all over again by the new assembly. That is even if they, 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 decide, they decide to, to bring it forth to a new president. Mm. So it's a challenge. It's a political system. I think it's political we we're talking about now. Mm. It's, more, it's more than constitutional issues. It's whether the party in power that has a majority in the national assembly think these issues are important enough to promote and push and approve. And uh, unfortunately, we are at the tail end of that particular party as a current um, uh, leadership. So let's see if anything changes in the next one, except, of course, the president decides to sign some of those bills, if not all of it, before May 29. Mm. Let me come back to you, Professor Wakocha. Let's talk about the role mm. of our National Assembly um, over time, since we began what we call a nascent democracy in this country. I mean, um, let's look at how, in other climes, for example, when we see prime minister's questions, they call them PMQs in the UK, um, where the prime minister shows up and he's questioned on certain issues or actions that he's taken. And these questions are thrown at him by members of the National Assembly or members of, you know, of the parliament because they are speaking to issues that concern members of their constituents, meaning that they're representing uh, their constituencies. Uh, we also see in the U.S. where half the time when issues are being deliberated on, it's basically and purely in the best interest or the common interest or overall interest of the people that they represent. How is that reflective here in, the part, in this part of the world over the years? And it's not just about the Ninth Assembly. All of the assemblies that we've seen, how well have, we, have these people done in terms of representing the interest of their constituents as opposed to personal interest? I, I think we have scored very low on the area of developing democratic culture. Um, in our discourses, you, find, you tend to find us uh, talking of powers and powers and not the people, the interest of the people. Um, both the government and all the institutions of government are answerable to the people. They belong to the people. And the interest of the people is supposed to be the driving force in formulation of policies. Um, but unfortunately, that does not appear to have been important to us as a nation uh, throughout, um, almost throughout our National Assembly experiences. Uh, you find that um, the will to do what needs to be done because it is in the interest of the people, has always been rather very low. And, and so you find this debate about uh, pandering to uh, the dignity of the office of the president, the president's desire uh, to retain the powers of the president, or the party's desire to retain the powers of the president. I think perhaps we are not putting sufficiently equipped and prepared people into those positions. Because the National Assembly is the supervisor to the executive. The president is answerable to the National Assembly. Even though he has immunity, the National Assembly is the only body that can exert disciplinary action against the president, including removing him from office. It is not for nothing that that body is drawn from the constituencies where the people vote them into position. So I think it's about the National Assembly being a little more assertive and being more conscious of the fact that they are there to serve the interests of the people and the interests of the nation. Look at these amendments we are talking about. And look at the examples we are giving. Ministers refusing to honor invitations. Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, Governor of Central Bank refusing to honor invitations. What says the National Assembly cannot compare them to attend? Section 89 provides for the power to issue warrant to compare their attendance. The Inspector General could be asked, compelled to bring them to the National Assembly. That has not been done. We are expecting them to be gentlemen and to uh, work in accordance with democratic culture to respond to 
responsible and reasonable invitations to come and explain to the representatives of the people or to the people through their representatives. But we are not asserting ourselves. The law provides for us to be able to compare them to attend. So is it that we are we are trying to be nice to the president or to the executive uh, that we don't want to exercise that power? The power is there in your hand. You don't want to exercise it, and you're not calling for amendment of the constitution to enable you someone, the one that the constitution says cannot be someone to uh, explain anything, criminal or civil. Mm. In reasonable countries, the president attends and explains to the legislature because they understand they are explaining to the people through their representatives. That is the culture we have not developed yet, perhaps as a result of the crop of people we have voted into these positions of responsibility. I bet that you could someday have people who will be conscious of what their commitment is, that their commitment is to the people, and who will, on their own, offer to come and explain when there is a situation. For now, uh, we are still playing the, um, the, uh, our traditional game of uh, who has the power, who is more important, uh, who is uh, uh, the superior one, uh, who can do and undo, and all of that. Um, now, the legislature needs to take us beyond this rhetoric and implement the law. Section 89 provides for them the capacity to compel attendance by issuing warrants. They should do so and let the Inspector General of Police fail to produce those people. Then we can turn back to the executive to blame the, the executive. But for now, they are not asserting themselves. They are not implementing the provisions of the existing law, the Constitution as it is, without amendment. Mm. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll, we'll talk about the role that we as uh, the... Uh, populists play in the kind or the level of impunity that we experience in leadership in Nigeria. Stay with us, we'll be right back. It's still Plus Politics and I'm being joined still by George Ashiro, the chairman of the ADC here in Lagos State, and Professor Richard Aduche Wokocha, who is a professor of law at the River State University in Port Hackett. Gentlemen, thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, before we went on that break, Professor Wokocha, you were making a point uh, about, you know, the onus being on the National Assembly and um, to, you know, make some of these changes. But let's talk about impunity and the level at which it is um, thriving in, the, in our nation. I mean, um, we see this among politicians. And I mean, I mean, I don't need to go into the uh, description or the definition of what impunity is. But uh, our leaders have so far um, displayed so, so much level of impunity over time. Um, so much so that even those who walk within and around them um, are beginning to tap from it. We see that level of impunity also. Uh, within our law enforcement, we see that same level of impunity even within the civil service. Um, so my big question is, how do we even begin to pivot away from this level of impunity if it has become the order of the day? Mr. Shiru. Well, uh, impunity um, will clearly refer to the fact that we have a culture and, you know, in any space, whether it's a corporate space, whether it's a uh, military space, whether it's traditional institutions, culture determines how people behave. And that culture is, is, is inherited from the leadership. So when the leadership displays um, a sense of not being accountable, then you do not expect followers to be accountable because they have a picked up the vibe, so to speak, from the leadership. And I think um, we have to look at models of leadership all over the world. We can see that in the United States of America, uh, the past president, the former president Donald Trump, is not being held to account for violations of certain areas of the law in New York. Whether they're business law or so political laws or constitutional laws, he's held accountable for it. And that's because you have a judiciary that is independent. Even the government itself is independent. You had the district, the, you had the, 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 the justice department investigating his own president. You might not be able to bring him to the stand, but once he's out of office, you have a reason to arrest him. So I think the general idea is that democracy is still new to us in Africa. We are still learning the context and concept of democracy. We are still transitioning from really from military rule, I believe. And, and, and so even though it's been 24 years plus, uh, really our people 
uh, our governments and various institutions in government, they do not understand the idea of accountability, of corporate governance, of, of justice, of equality, of human rights, and all of the things that are critical, you know, and that's culture. That's a, that's a, that's a culture we do not have. And I'm not talking about culture as in terms of your genetics or, or you know, or your tribal culture. I'm talking about as a nation. We do not have a national culture. We do not have an, a national ideology of what we believe in that people will follow through and say, as Nigerians, we don't steal. As Nigerians, we, you know, we're not corrupt. As Nigerians, because, unfortunately, what has been seen through history is that different people have come into leadership, done whatever they want to do, and just gone away with it. And it's become the culture that future generations have picked up from. Even good quality individuals, the moment you get into a system, the system then becomes, you know, your, your, your culture, your practice. So that's why you hear good people go into politics and become bad, because there's not enough osmosis of those kinds of people. And uh, we need to do a lot of work by creating democratic institutions that will teach that kind of culture which we are hoping for, so that hopefully the next, the next National Assembly, the next leaders of the country, and so on and so forth, even at the political party system level, uh, we understand the importance of doing what is best for Nigeria, not what is best for us, or you know, putting party before the people. That's what I think. Mm. Professor Walker, let's talk about us, the people, the, the electorate, and, and the role that we play in how we are led, because you, you can't have leaders without the led. Um, do we place less emphasis on the people? Do we sit a lot on the fence and say, well, they have the police, they have the army, they have the money, they have everything, and we have nothing. We're just mere people. I ask this because um, I know that um, at some point in my life, I know um, that I had been to of homes of some of these political leaders, local government chairmen, uh, senators, and there are people who leave off of these people, um, not caring where these monies come from, but they go to them with all their problems, financial and otherwise. And I'm asking... Could we also be responsible for the kind of leadership that we're getting, not as a result of just the fact that they come from our environment, but because of the pressure that we put on them, wrong pressure? Well, um, you can say yes. Um, um, we subject public officers to pressures that are not... Um, Professor Wakacha, are you still there? Uh, desirable for people who want to. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Professor, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, good. So you can say yes, yes um, that to subject them to pressures that are not desirable for people who want ability. But that is not enough. Prison. It's not at all enough prison. Um, the reason we take pains to commit policies to law is to make them compulsory, to ensure that the public space is governed by pre-agreed norms. And when that is done, it does not matter what you are asked to pay. You know, uh, I have consistently argued, even on this station, that the degree of responsibility government exhibits is directly related to the effective sharing system that have no government no government will want to be branded as a government that is irresponsive to complaints or as mm -hmm. a government that is detached from the people. They will pay a price at the next election. So I, I see a direct relationship between our perfecting our electoral reforms and getting government to be responsible and responsible. What you are experiencing in this country happens where government is detached from the people. Well, that detachment usually results from government being able to get this. Professor Wakocha, are you still there? I think that we ha have lost that connection. But let, let me toss back to um, Mr. Shiri. Can you quickly um, just chime in there before I, I pose my next question? Sorry? Can you quickly chime in um, as per what our role in making sure that these people do their job as opposed to what we do, going to them for handouts? Well, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the, the nature of our democracy, I, I keep saying it, it's a, it's a new culture. It's a generational issue. 
that we are coming out of a repressed society that has been repressed over the years from uh, inheriting the monarch monarchical system then into the uh, you know, erect experimentation with their parliamentary system for a very short period of time, and then a long period of military rule. And so people have become jaundiced that it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you do, people in authority will do whatever they want to do. And that's why the citizens, uh, there's a lot of apathy. Look at this last elections. Despite the massive voter drive, the, the, um, the voter turnout was still very, very low, you know, extremely low. And so it indicates to us that um, people don't believe in democracy yet. People don't trust in the democratic system. People believe people are disillusioned in the leadership that we offer them. And a lot of citizens believe that it, it, regardless of how they vote, decisions have been made before as to who emerges a leader. And so when you have all of these factors that are so evident for, for, for people to see, it then makes sense for them not to be interested. And besides, there is no safety net for people economically. So you cannot say, oh, if I choose to fight for government, if I take my time uh, you know, to fight for this right or that right, I'm still protected in terms of my welfare, in terms of my education, my children. And so when all of these factors are put together, it, it is difficult to hold the citizens responsible for the apathy they show in governance. It is difficult. I would, I would say that uh, for, because we are politicians who are moving to the grassroots level, we deal with people on a daily basis. We're not in you know, echelons of power where we are shielded with bulletproof vehicles and, and doors. We see and hear from these people every day. And at the, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to take a transformational or transcendent uh, level of leadership to be able to relate with the people and still provide leadership at the very top. And I'm, 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 I'm unfortunately, the way we vote right now is because we haven't got anybody or enough people demonstrating that type of leadership for us to say, oh, this is the standard. And you can see young people screaming and shouting on social media now because they're frustrated. They want something that shows more of what they've seen abroad. Whereas 30 years ago, without the internet, we didn't have the access to know how other nations and other countries, other citizens, how they took uh, their, their, their governments into account. But now it's obvious. Anything you do here in Nigeria can see New Zealand in real time. Mm. So hopefully, 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 uh, in, my, in my lifetime, uh, we will begin to see people holding those in power to account and enforcing it judicially. I like that you brought in the electoral process because I, I was about to say that we can't talk about accountability without talking about the process in which brings these people into power. And you've touched a bit on it. Um, but then, you know, I think you and I have had, you know, this conversation before about how this, the, the political systems that throw up whoever the candidate or the flag bearer would be at the end of the day, um, again, you talked about the fact that we had a low voter turnout and whether it was voter pr pr repression or suppression, I beg your pardon, or it was voter apathy, a combination of things. But then it still had to do with us, the people. Now you're saying that, yes, our uh, the democratic process is still new, it's still you know, fresh to us and we're yet to understand and embrace it. But then if we want a change, we obviously ought to be part of that change. But then when you talk about change, the average person is saying, well, I came out and vote. I came out to vote. I got my PVC. But does it end there? Because we, uh, Professor Wokocha also made mention of electoral reforms. We can only just, we can talk about these electoral reforms. But when it comes down to the electoral process in itself, and it's still this flood, look at what happened in Adamawa State. Look at what happened here in Lagos State. Can we really ask for accountability from people who are a result of this process? Um, again, it is a matter of law. You know, um, if, if someone has violated uh, a, a, constitutional, a constitutional process, either through the electoral system or criminal activity, it is the duty of the citizens to hold them to account, especially if they're already in public office. It is the duty. So what I was trying to explain is that the people who are going to hold you to account also depend on you to, to feed. You can imagine the dichotomy because we do not have individual. The economy has not empowered enough people to be sufficiently financially independent. Look at the police who you are going to ask to arrest a man in power. Who is the one feeding the same man in power? How is he going to be able to do his job effectively? So until the derivative 
groups that we are fighting for, these various amendments, allow the you know true independence of the of the security apparatus, true independence of the judicial apparatus. True, when I mean true, I mean powerfully constitutionally and financially independent, so that they can do their job without the worry that the process that brings me forth as the chairman of this institution or chairman of that institution requires the political approval of the same people that I want to prosecute. So there has to be a strong enough, I mean, whether we like it or not, these constitutional amendments, which is the basis of this conversation tonight, they are critical to the survival of our democracy in the long term. It's not for individual parties or individual leaders to say, oh, for the sake of me protecting my power, the greater good of the people is not taken into consideration. Because what then happens is that there has no change between the state of the people 30 years ago to now. The GDP remains, the per capita remains the same. That obviously means something has gone wrong. Mm. There has to be the concept of legacy, which means we are constant, constantly and consistently over the years improving the welfare of the people. And the statistics must show it. If you look at inflation in the UK, I mean, when I was in school in the UK, I looked at how much, you know, my pounds was getting for pounds at that time. I still getting the same amount for now. I could buy the same things I was buying for 10 pounds, 30, 20 years ago. I the same things I could buy for maybe just about 80, 80 pence. But here, it is impossible. It is an order of two, three, four, five thousand percent in terms of our inflationary projects. Mm -hmm. So we know fully well that our, our institutions are not getting stronger. They are not getting better. So there is something wrong fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And so this, this conversation cannot stop. And that's the duty of the media constantly ensuring that the right information and the right issues are raised non-stop until attention is given by those in authority. All right. Well, I want to say thank you, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we are out of time. George Ashiru is the chairman, ADC, Lagos State, and Professor Richard Aduche Wokocha is a professor of law at the River State University of Port Hacker. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being part of the conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us on the show tonight. And thank you all for being part of the conversation from Monday till today. As usual on Fridays, we leave you with the highlights of the week. And here you go. My name is Mary Anna Kun. We'll see you next week on Trust Politics. No parameter. There are, there are no conditions. Mm -hmm. currently on ground that can guarantee the Nigerian masses to have a senior president who will say unanimously that this one fits the bill. It's the people's choice. Look at, look at the array of candidates. If I'm to make a choice, I won't say it, you know, there are few persons who have the character and integrity and a value system to drive the system. Mm -hmm. See, to become senior president, your first objective will be the interest of the country. But unfortunately, Nigerians, 90% of us, do not consider our country's interests first. And it is time to begin to put the interests of Nigeria first. And I will tell you, if you want to put this election that has just happened side by side with the 27 election, you will see a lot of uh, similarities with the way and manner the elections are conducted. And we should stop lying to ourselves as Nigerians. We cannot be doing the same thing and be expecting different results. Has 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 gotten gotten herself into. To me, it was we, we didn't have a clear cut economic policy. There is no way you can pinpoint any clear cut economic policy of this of this administration. Since so everything was done at just a snap, just you know something that just pick up and say, okay, I want to do it now and now and now. Mm. So that's how we got to, to the stage that we are now. We want to be prosecuted and we want appropriate positive measures to be met. Else. Else, Nigerians, we look at it and say, yes, he has done what he, he was being asked to do. We have seen series of, uh, of, uh, of uh, policemen in this country running foul of our laws, of our rules, and the rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. The moment they are being transferred, the, uh, when, when, when their case files are being brought, they will say, yes, they are being transferred. And that will be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Nigeria of today is different from Nigeria of yesterday. Okay. We want that particular policeman to be brought to book. And not only that, even the wreck that had gone outside 
is jurisdiction. To go and announce results should not just should not only be prosecuted as a uh, NH chairman is being uh, 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 demanded. We want him prosecuted and we want him to be punished accordingly. There is a cardinal principle about borrowing, and that is you have to have a project to commit that borrowing to. Anybody who is borrowing to feed is in trouble, is in financial crisis. That is the first thing. The second thing is your ability to repay your loan. Anywhere you go, anywhere at all, you go to a bank or a financial institution and you want to take a loan, that bank or financial institution is going to look at your finances and check that you are able to repay that loan. If you are not able to repay that loan, then regardless of what you want to use the loan for, regardless of your net worth, the bank or financial institution is going to decline giving you the loan. A country that is using 96% of its total earnings just to service debt, 96% or whatever the country earns, and that is Nigeria, is used in servicing debt, meaning the rest of the expenditure of this country, including recurrent expenditure, which involves payment of salaries, travels, office costs, and all of those kind of things, are being financed with borrowing, is in financial catastrophe.